In the cold expanse of space, a flicker of light traveled across the cosmos. A vessel, not of war or commerce, but one of curiosity and courage. It carried humanity's bravest, en route to the fabled Intergalactic Council, a body of civilizations that had governed the stars long before humans had even gazed upon them. As the ship hummed through the void, its crew members were acutely aware of the history they carried on their shoulders. They were envoys, scientists, soldiers, ambassadors of a young race stepping into a gallery of ancients. The ship's arrival was met with a mixture of fascination and condescension from the assembled species of the Council. The halls that had echoed with the footsteps of countless beings now resonated with the determined strides of humans. Under the gaze of a thousand alien eyes, the humans were given their welcome, a challenge. The gauntlet, it was called. An ancient tradition where strength, intellect, and spirit were tested. To fail meant to forfeit humanity's place in this prestigious assembly. To succeed. But no one had considered that possibility, least of all the reigning champions, the formidable Zoltharians. This chapter of human history began in an arena that shimmered with energy barriers and holographic landscapes. The trials ahead were unknown, a mystery wrapped in an enigma, as diverse as the Council itself. As the human team stood in the heart of the arena, the air was electric with anticipation. They could sense the amusement of the Zoltharians, a species whose strength was legendary, whose empire had been unchallenged until this very moment. The smirk on the Zoltharian leader's face was unmistakable, their confidence absolute. But humans had a gift, an ember that burned brightly in the face of the overwhelming dark, the ability to hope against odds, to dream in the face of nightmare. This ember ignited as the first trial was unveiled, a test of strength. But while others might rely on brute force, the humans leaned into their heritage, a lineage of problem solvers, of thinkers who looked beyond the muscle and sinew to the power of the mind and the will. The challenge began, and the humans sprang into action. They were not the strongest, their bodies were frail compared to the giants they faced. But where brawn failed, they pivoted to cunning to speed, to the unyielding force of human ingenuity. The Council watched in stunned silence as the humans circumvented what seemed an impassable obstacle with a solution so simple, yet so unexpected, that it took the arena a moment to register their success. That first triumph was a spark that kindled a flame. As the human team returned to their quarters, there was no raucous celebration, no pompous display of victory. Instead, there was a shared look among them, a silent acknowledgement of the road ahead. They had caught a glimpse of the peak they sought to conquer, and though the journey would be fraught with peril, it was a journey they were now determined to make. For in that moment, in the improbable triumph of the underdog, humanity had announced its arrival. Not with a roar, but with the whisper of a page turning, the story of the cosmos opening to a new chapter the chapter of the human race. As the second trial of the gauntlet loomed ahead, the human team found themselves in the vast hollow belly of a spacecraft bound for the survival arena, a planet engineered to replicate Earth's most extreme conditions. Dubbed the Crucible, this planet was a melting pot of environmental challenges, from scorching deserts to freezing tundras, designed to push contestants to their limits. The team was a mosaic of Earth's diversity. Astronauts who had weathered the solitude of space, scientists who had plumbed the ocean's abyss, and explorers who had braved the uncharted jungles. Each had faced Earth's fury, yet this was different. The Crucible was a testament to alien technology's ability to simulate environments with terrifying accuracy. And it was here that humanity would face its past once more. The dropship descended, its hull groaning under the strain of atmospheric entry, as if protesting its return to a primal state. The team members glanced at each other, their suits' visors reflecting a shared resolve. These were no ordinary suits, but the pinnacle of human ingenuity, a weave of fibers from the silkworms of Earth, graphene layers only atoms thick, and a self-healing polymer that whispered tales of the human spirit in every thread. They landed with a jolt that ran up their spines, and the hatch hissed open to reveal a landscape of red sands whipped into a frenzy by howling winds. The heat was a physical presence, 
a wall that sought to drive them back into their ship. But forward was the only way humanity knew. Their first task was to navigate the treacherous dunes of searing thought, a field of sand that would glass beneath a lesser sun. The team advanced, their boots sinking and rising with each laborious step. While overhead, the Zoltharians observed with a detached curiosity that masked their anticipation of failure. Hours turned to days as the team faced trial after trial within the crucible. They crossed the dunes, scaled the cliffs of frozen echoes, and traversed the chasm of storms. They endured, not through the brute force that was expected of competitors, but through the power of human connection. Where one stumbled, another would offer a hand. Where one faltered, another would share a word of encouragement. It was during the penultimate trial, the Forest of Whispers, that the humans displayed not just the resilience of their bodies, but the endurance of their souls. As the bioluminescent foliage closed in around them, the darkness of the forest seemed to press upon their spirits. Yet, it was here, amidst the alien flora, that they found a kinship with this otherworldly place, an understanding that life, in all its forms, struggled and thrived just as it did on Earth. Emerging from the crucible, the human team was changed. The scars they bore were not just the marks of survival, but the emblems of a bond that had deepened, a bond with each other, and a newfound bond with the universe that had tested them so fiercely. They had not conquered the crucible. They had become a part of its legacy, a testament to the idea that even the strongest forge is not meant to break, but to temper. And as the team boarded the vessel to return to the Intergalactic Council station, they carried with them not the arrogance of conquerors, but the quiet confidence of those who have seen the edge of their own capabilities and stepped beyond it. They were ready for the next trial, ready for whatever the gauntlet could throw at them, because they were human, and being human meant facing the tempest with a smile and the unknown with open arms. The third trial had been designed to test the agility and strategic thinking of the participants. Set in a massive arena, the challenge was a live-action chess game known as the Strategist's Gambit. Each team member would be a piece on the board, their movements dictated by the quick decisions of their appointed leader. It was not just a physical challenge, but a battle of wits. Captain Sarah Chen stood elevated on the commander's podium, gazing down at the holographic field that projected the arena below. She was their strategist, selected for her unparalleled ability to see patterns where others saw chaos. Chen was a veteran of terrestrial conflicts, but here in the expanse of space, she wielded her intellect as her weapon. She had studied alien tactics and had found them rigid, predictable, bound by honor codes and ancient traditions. Humanity's unpredictable nature was their wild card. As the game commenced, Chen's commands were swift and unorthodox. Each move seemed a misstep, each command a folly to the seasoned warriors of other worlds. The Zoltharians smirked from their lofty stands, confident in their impending victory. The human pieces moved in seemingly erratic patterns, advancing, retreating, and sacrificing themselves in bewildering successions. On the ground, Lieutenant Marko Petrov dashed across the illuminated tiles, each step igniting the sensors beneath. A former parkour athlete turned marine, his body remembered the urban landscapes of Earth as he pivoted and leaped, his movements a blend of grace and power. With each of Chen's commands, he adapted, interpreting her strategy through the lens of his physical prowess. Meanwhile, Dr. Lisa Gomez, the team's biologist, found herself cornered by an imposing alien opponent, one of the Zoltharian knights. Their species was known for their strength, but Gomez had spent her life studying the minute workings of life. She understood the strengths and weaknesses of biological beings, and as she sidestepped at the last possible second, she proved that knowledge could triumph over might. The Council watched with growing unease as the humans began to gain the upper hand. The other species, bound by their conventional strategies, were unable to adapt to the humans' inventive plays. The arena, once filled with the contemptuous murmurs of the audience, now thrummed with the tense silence of uncertainty. Chen, from her podium, was the orchestrator of a symphony of movement, her team members' instruments that played a tune unfamiliar to the galactic audience. She led them through the gambit, not as pieces to be sacrificed, but as individuals, 
each move a testament to their unique strengths, and as the final move was made, a seemingly reckless advance by Chen herself, placing her directly in the line of danger, the trap was sprung. It was not Chen who was vulnerable, but her opponent, who had underestimated humanity's propensity for self-risk for the greater good. The trial ended with the human team declared victorious, the arena resonating with the sound of their triumph. The Zoltharian smirks had vanished, replaced by grudging respect for the newcomers who had turned the strategist's gambit on its head. As the team regrouped, they exchanged glances that spoke volumes. They had been tested in strength and survival, and now in strategy, and they had emerged not just unscathed, but emboldened. Their humanity, with all its creativity and unpredictability, had proven to be their greatest asset, and it was clear that in the gauntlet, where every species brought their best, humanity's best was unlike anything the galaxy had ever seen. After the mental exertion of the strategist's gambit, the human team found themselves standing at the threshold of the fourth trial, one that would take them into the heart of a simulated war zone named the Crucible of Conflict. It was a sprawling virtual landscape generated within the Council's arena, simulating a historical battle from the archives of a warrior species, the Kragul. These battles were legendary for their intensity, a chaotic blend of strategy and raw combat prowess, often used by the Council to measure a species' capacity for warfare. The humans donned their neural sync combat suits, interfacing with the simulation to an extent that every sensation felt alarmingly real. For this trial, the humans were not just to survive but to emerge victorious in an environment where every other species had honed their martial skills for millennia. Lieutenant Grace Kim, the team's combat specialist and historian, was well versed in the art of warfare, having dedicated her life to studying Earth's most significant battles. As they strategized, Grace drew from humanity's rich and tumultuous history, advocating for guerrilla tactics over conventional warfare, knowing full well that their physical capabilities were outmatched. As the simulation began, the arena transformed into a dystopian battlefield. The sky darkened with the smoke of virtual fires, and the ground trembled with the sounds of explosions. The human team, vastly outnumbered by the Kragul warriors, felt the weight of history against them. But Grace's plan was one of clever diversions and tactical retreats, forcing the enemy into a drawn-out chase rather than a head-on confrontation. Sergeant Leo Rodriguez, with his expertise in demolitions, rigged the virtual landscape with traps and explosives. His hands moved with practiced ease, his every action calculated to cause maximum disruption within enemy ranks. Meanwhile, Dr. Emily Wong, the team's physicist, employed her understanding of energy and matter manipulating the simulated environment to their advantage, creating barriers and illusions that disoriented their foes. The Krahul, programmed to emulate their ancestors' tactics, advanced with relentless determination. But for every wave that crashed upon the humans, two more were broken by their ingenuity. The Krahul had not encountered a species that fought like the humans did, adaptable, unpredictable, and utterly resourceful. Grace, Watching the battle unfold, directed her team with the precision of a master conductor. Each squad member was an extension of her will, every move a note in a symphony of survival. Their objective was not to win by sheer force, but to outlast, to endure, and to seize victory in a moment crafted by patience and resolve. As the final hours of the trial waned, the humans executed a series of feints that led the Kraghul into a narrow valley. It was there that Rodriguez's traps sprung to life, and the enemy was ensnared. The battle turned quickly thereafter, and when the simulation faded and the arena lights returned, the human team was left standing, weary but undefeated. The audience, a collection of beings who had viewed war as an immutable art, were silent in contemplation. Humanity had not just survived, they had rewritten the very concept of conflict that the galaxy had accepted. As the humans exited the simulation, their eyes not on the stands but on each other. They knew they had shown the Council a new horizon in warfare, one where intellect was as potent as any weapon. The fourth trial was not just a victory, it was a declaration. Humanity's resilience was matched only by their strategic brilliance. They had come as underdogs to the gauntlet, but now they stood as contenders, their gaze fixed on the trials ahead. 
their hearts beating to the rhythm of an ancient human defiance that whispered through the ages, ad astra per aspera, to the stars through difficulties. The atmosphere in the council chamber was electric with anticipation. The fifth trial was unlike any that had come before. It was to be a test of altruism, an evaluation designed to measure the capacity of a species for compassion, a virtue the council held in high regard, even in their valorization of strength. In this trial, named the Crucible of Bonds, teams would need to rescue members of competing species from complex disaster scenarios. The human team members stood shoulder to shoulder as they were briefed. Their mission was clear, to navigate through a series of calamities on a simulated planet where other contestants were trapped. It was a task that required not only bravery and skill, but an understanding of the various alien physiologies and cultures they would encounter. Dr. Niles Banner, the chief medical officer, had studied the anatomical data of the Council species until his eyes ached. He knew that in the coming hours, that knowledge could mean the difference between life and death. Flanking him were engineers, medics, and linguists, all selected for their expertise and their ability to empathize. As the trial commenced, the humans encountered their first challenge, a burning structure with trapped Ellurians, beings who breathed a methane mix and could not survive the smoke of the common fire. Using their suits to filter the air, the humans created a breathable path to extract the Ellurians. It was a tense, fraught endeavor but the human team moved with precision and care, their actions saving lives that would have otherwise been lost to the flames. In the next scenario, the humans faced a different dilemma. A chemical spill had incapacitated a group of Telerians, a species whose telepathic abilities made them vulnerable to the toxic mental barrage caused by the spill. Utilizing a combination of soundproofing equipment and pharmacological agents, the team fashioned a barrier against the noxious onslaught allowing them to safely evacuate the afflicted Telerians. The most daunting task awaited them at the site of a collapsed mine, where several Zoltharian miners lay trapped. These were the same Zoltharians who had looked upon the humans with disdain, the same ones who had doubted their worth and strength. And yet, without hesitation, the humans ventured into the rubble. Lieutenant Ava Jackson, a former search and rescue leader, led the charge. Her team moved boulders that should have been immovable, shored up collapsing tunnels with technology hastily adapted on the spot, and provided medical aid with hands that were steady despite the danger that surrounded them. It was a rescue effort that defied the scope of physical prowess. It was a demonstration of will. When the last Zoltharian was brought safely to the surface, there was a moment of profound silence. The Zoltharians, known for their pride and strength, found themselves at a loss for words. Their leader, a veteran of countless skirmishes, nodded to the humans, a gesture of respect that rippled through the onlooking species. The Council had witnessed acts of heroism before, but the altruism displayed by humanity touched something deeper. Here was a species that fought not for glory or survival, but for the sake of others. Here was a species that, despite being newcomers to the galactic stage, showed a profound understanding of what it meant to be part of a community. The fifth trial ended with applause, a rare occurrence in the council chamber. It was an acknowledgement not just of the human success, but of the bonds they had formed. Bonds that transcended species. Bonds that, in the quiet reflection that followed, would begin to unravel the preconceived notions held about humanity. The humans returned to their quarters, not with the exuberance of victory, but with the quiet satisfaction of a job well done. They had saved lives, changed minds, and perhaps, in the process, begun to change the very fabric of the Council itself. For they had shown that even the strongest species can falter, and that in times of need, the strength to save comes not from muscle, but from the heart. The sixth trial was not merely a test. It was a riddle wrapped in an enigma, known among the Council species as the Labyrinth of Logic. Its design was deceptively simple, a vast and intricate maze, its walls shifting and changing with each decision made by the contestants. Yet it was not the physical walls that posed the greatest challenge, but the puzzles that lay within, each requiring a solution that melded scientific knowledge with creative thinking. This was a realm where the renowned physicist Dr. Ariadne Nguyen shone, 
a child prodigy who became humanity's brightest star in theoretical physics, she was tasked with leading the team through the labyrinth. Her mind, capable of holding the complexities of quantum mechanics and the vastness of cosmic theories, was now focused on the conundrums of the maze. As the trial commenced, the team entered the labyrinth, the walls glimmering with a bioluminescent glow. The first puzzle was a series of equations etched in light, equations that governed the very fabric of the maze. To proceed, one must manipulate these universal constants, but the wrong calculation could mean entrapment. With her natural grace, Arya deduced the patterns, her fingers dancing through the equations like a maestro, and the walls parted, revealing the path forward. The next challenge was an array of alien flora that obstructed their way, releasing toxins when touched. Dr. Mikhail Romanov, the team's botanist, deciphered the alien plant's biochemistry, finding the key to neutralizing the poison. With a concoction of his own making, he created a safe passage through the verdant barrier, his expertise turning the dangerous foliage into harmless vegetation. Deeper into the labyrinth, the team encountered a holographic star system, its planets orbiting in a mesmerizing dance. Here, navigation was based on gravitational pull and astrophysical anomalies. Ava, the navigator, stepped forward. She was a sailor of the stars, accustomed to the celestial seas. Reading the cosmic tide, she charted a course through the holographic heavens. Her instincts as infallible in the labyrinth as they were in the vacuum of space. The final puzzle was the most daunting, a mirror room, where reflections caused infinite recursion of the maze itself. Here, the team's cohesion was key. Each member's reflection held a fragment of the exit code, only visible from certain angles and perspectives. It was Captain Sarah Chen's task to unify these reflections, to see the whole picture from the scattered parts. Under her guidance, the team aligned, forming a human kaleidoscope that revealed the final exit sequence in their combined reflections. As they emerged from the labyrinth, it was clear that the trial was more than a measure of intellect. It was a testament to human innovation. The Council had seen species solve parts of the labyrinth, but none had traversed its entirety with such unity and resourcefulness. In the silence that followed their exit, respect was palpable. Even the most enigmatic species among the Council nodded in acknowledgement of the rare feat they had witnessed. The humans had not just solved the puzzles, they had woven together a tapestry of their collective strengths, each thread as vital as the next. Back in the human quarters, there was no triumphant roar, no shouts of elation. Instead, there was the serene knowledge that together, they were more than the sum of their parts. They were individuals, but when woven together by the threads of their shared humanity, they formed an unbreakable bond, a bond that the labyrinth, with all its cunning and guile, could not contain. The seventh trial, known as the Crucible of Valor, was a testament not to the physical or intellectual capabilities of the contestants, but to their courage and moral fiber. This trial was a galactic-scale simulation where each team had to make critical decisions that would affect the lives of billions on a virtual planet. The scenarios ranged from natural disasters to ethical dilemmas involving interstellar diplomacy and warfare. This was a domain where the human team's diplomat, Ambassador Elena Marquez, took the lead. Elena had a history of navigating the treacherous waters of Earth's politics and her skills were about to be tested on an unprecedented scale. The first scenario placed them in the midst of an impending asteroid collision with the virtual planet. With limited resources and time, Elena coordinated a planetary evacuation plan while Dr. Arya Nguyen and Dr. Mikhail Romanov developed a last-minute defense system to divert the asteroid's path. The simulation's complexity was such that every action had a ripple effect, impacting the virtual civilization's future in profound ways. Next, they faced a moral quandary when confronted with an advanced alien species demanding the surrender of the planet's inhabitants for experimentation in exchange for advanced technology. Here, Elena's negotiation skills were paramount. She engaged in high-stakes diplomacy, weaving through the ethical implications and the potential benefits. Her approach was to find a middle ground that preserved the dignity and safety of the planet's inhabitants while securing a beneficial relationship with the alien species. It was a delicate balance, requiring finesse and a deep understanding of both human 
and alien perspectives. As the trial progressed, the scenarios became increasingly complex, challenging the team to consider not just the immediate effects of their decisions, but their long-term implications for the virtual civilization's development and survival. In one scenario, they were faced with a civil war, where choosing a side meant deciding the planet's cultural and political future. Instead of picking sides, Elena proposed a peace summit, bringing the warring factions to the negotiation table. Her strategy was not to impose peace but to facilitate it, allowing the factions to recognize their shared goals and common humanity. The final challenge was perhaps the most daunting, a pandemic threatening the virtual planet's population. With no immediate cure, the team had to strategize on quarantine measures, resource allocation, and public communication to prevent panic. Here, every team member's expertise came into play, from Dr. Banner's medical knowledge to Lieutenant Ava Jackson's logistical skills. Emerging from the crucible of valor, the human team had not only demonstrated their bravery and quick thinking, but also their profound commitment to ethical principles and the well-being of others, even in a simulated environment. Their decisions reflected a deep moral compass, showcasing humanity's capacity for compassion, empathy, and sacrifice. The Council, accustomed to evaluating species based on their strength and intelligence, found themselves considering a new metric the value of a species' ethical judgment and moral courage. The humans, with their diverse backgrounds and unified approach to the galaxy's most pressing dilemmas, had offered a new perspective on valor, one not measured by victories in battle, but by the lives saved, the peace brokered, and the futures secured. Back among their peers, the team reflected on their journey through the crucible of valor. They had faced the darkest scenarios imaginable, Yet their humanity, their ability to care deeply for others, had been their guiding light. It was this, they realized, that was their true strength. This revelation, born in the heart of a trial, was perhaps their most significant victory, for it underscored the indomitable spirit of humanity, a force capable of changing not just the fate of a virtual planet, but the course of the galaxy itself. The eighth trial, heralded as the harmony of the spheres, was an audacious blend of artistry and science designed to test the contestants' ability to create beauty from chaos. It was a challenge that sought to delve into the soul of a species, revealing its capacity for creativity and expression. This trial was set within an enormous auditorium, its walls alive with the flowing colors of nebulae and the twinkling of distant stars, forming a canvas as boundless as the universe itself. At the heart of the auditorium stood the instrument, a device capable of translating the movements and emotions of the performers into a symphony of light and sound that resonated throughout the cosmos. Enter Maestro Thomas Rivera, a composer, who at once enchanted the concert halls of Earth with melodies that spoke of the human condition. His task was to lead his team and the gathered species of the Council in a performance that would embody humanity's journey through the cosmos, from the tentative steps on the moon to the bold leaps into the unknown. The performance began with the gentle hum of the instrument, its soundscape echoing the birth of stars. Tomas, with movements that bridged the gap between conductor and alchemist, coaxed from the instrument a melody that was both haunting and hopeful. The team, each member equipped with sensors that captured their motions and emotions, danced around Tomas, their movements painting streaks of light in the air, their feelings weaving the fabric of the melody. As the performance unfolded, the melody grew in complexity, reflecting humanity's trials and triumphs. The lows were deep, mimicking the sorrow of lost explorers and forgotten dreams. Yet these were always followed by soaring highs, capturing the spirit of discovery and the joy of understanding. The team's dance became a narrative, a story told not through words, but through the universal language of music and light. Dr. Aryan Gien's movements illustrated the elegance of mathematical equations that bound the universe, while Lieutenant Ava Jackson's martial prowess translated into a dynamic rhythm that spoke of humanity's resilience. Dr. Niles Banner's deliberate steps added a layer of harmony that hinted at the delicate balance of life, and Ambassador Elena Marquez's graceful presence brought a coherence to the performance, her movements a testament to humanity's quest for peace and unity. As the final note echoed through the auditorium, 
a profound silence enveloped the assembly. The performance had transcended mere entertainment. It was a revelation of humanity's essence, a species that found beauty in the midst of the void, that could weave together the threads of the cosmos into a tapestry of light and sound. The Council, moved by the display, recognized something in the humans they had not seen before, a boundless creativity and a profound understanding of the universe's harmony. It was a reminder that amidst the calculations, the strategies, and the survival instincts, there lay the heart of exploration, the desire not just to reach the stars, but to understand and appreciate their beauty. For Tomas and his team, the harmony of the spheres was more than a trial. It was a declaration of humanity's place in the cosmos. They had shown that amidst the myriad species of the galaxy, humans could sing with their own unique voice, a voice that echoed with hope, wonder, and an unyielding desire to connect with the infinite. As they stepped down from the stage, their hearts light with the knowledge that they had shared a piece of their soul with the universe. The applause that followed was not just for their performance, but for what it represented, the undeniable presence of humanity among the stars, a species capable of both understanding the universe and contributing to its endless melody. In the penultimate trial of the gauntlet, dubbed the Apex of Unity, the Council sought to measure the depth of the contestants' ability to inspire and lead not just among their own species, but across the diverse civilizations of the galaxy. The challenge was set on a virtual platform that simulated crisis scenarios across multiple planets, each scenario demanding leadership that could transcend cultural and species boundaries to unite disparate groups towards common goals. Commander Jameson Locke, a veteran of Earth's peacekeeping forces, stepped forward to navigate this complex trial. Locke was known for his unwavering resolve and his ability to see the humanity in everyone, even in the midst of conflict. His leadership had turned the tide in many Earth conflicts, earning him a reputation as a unifier. Now, he faced a challenge that stretched beyond the familiar terrains of Earth to the vast and varied landscapes of alien worlds. The first scenario placed Locke and his team on a planet torn by civil strife, where two dominant species were locked in a bitter and seemingly endless conflict. Locke's approach was not to impose peace but to facilitate it, creating a space where representatives of both species could share their grievances and aspirations. Through tireless negotiation and genuine empathy, Locke managed to broker a ceasefire, laying the groundwork for a peace that was co-created, not enforced. Next, the team was transported to a world facing an ecological disaster that threatened all life forms. Here, Locke's leadership was tested not in the realm of diplomacy, but in orchestrating a planet-wide effort to avert catastrophe. He rallied scientists, engineers, and leaders from various species to collaborate on a solution that combined advanced technology with traditional knowledge, showcasing humanity's respect for both innovation and heritage. In each scenario, Locke's calm demeanor and steadfast belief in the potential for unity and diversity resonated with the participants. His ability to listen and empathize, to find common ground amid discord, became the beacon that guided disparate groups towards cooperation. As the trial progressed, it became evident that the apex of unity was more than a test of leadership. It was a lesson in the power of empathy and the strength that lies in diversity. Locke and his team demonstrated that true leadership does not seek to dominate but to empower, not to dictate but to collaborate. When the final scenario concluded, a successful diplomatic resolution to an interstellar standoff that could have led to war, the council chamber was abuzz with discussions. The human team had shown that leadership, at its core, was about bringing out the best in others, about bridging divides and creating something greater from the sum of its parts. Locke's performance in the apex of unity did not just earn the humans' accolades. It shifted the narrative. Humanity was no longer seen as a fledgling species struggling to find its place among the stars, but as a valuable ally, capable of leading with wisdom and compassion. As the team prepared for the final trial, they reflected on their journey through the gauntlet. They had faced each challenge with the collective strength of their diversity, their humanity binding them together. They had shown the galaxy that to be human was to understand the value of unity, to inspire hope, 
and to lead by example. The apex of unity was not just a trial they had passed, it was a message they had sent to the cosmos. In the tapestry of galactic civilizations, humanity was ready to weave its thread, colored with the hues of empathy, leadership, and an unyielding commitment to peace. The final trial, known as the Celestial Forge, was a test of innovation and adaptability. It required the contestants to use a combination of advanced technology, alien materials, and their unique skills to solve a problem that had stumped the brightest minds of the Council, the restoration of a dying star. This task was not just about scientific prowess. It demanded creativity, teamwork, and a deep understanding of the cosmic forces at play. Dr. Helen Zhao, a leading astrophysicist and engineer on the human team, took the helm for this monumental challenge. Helen was no stranger to the stars. She had dedicated her life to the study of cosmic phenomena, dreaming of the day humanity could harness the power of the cosmos itself. Now, standing on the precipice of that dream, Helen felt the weight of her team's journey through the gauntlet. They had faced trials of strength, wit, morality, and unity. Each trial had revealed a facet of humanity's potential. And now, the Celestial Forge would be the crucible to test their capacity to transcend the bounds of known science. The Dying Star, a red giant on the verge of collapse, loomed large on the simulation screen. The team was given access to a theoretical device, the Star Forger, a tool that could manipulate gravitational fields, stellar matter, and quantum energies. But to use it effectively, they had to understand the star's intricate balance of forces. Helen's plan was audacious. It involved the creation of a controlled black hole to siphon off the excess mass of the red giant, stabilizing it and preventing its collapse. This required not only precise calculations, but also a daring manipulation of energies that bordered on the fantastical. As Helen directed the operation, her team rallied around her, each member contributing their expertise. Dr. Arya Nguyen provided the quantum calculations needed to stabilize the black hole. Commander Jameson Locke coordinated the team's efforts, ensuring that every action was perfectly timed. Maestro Tomas Rivera, drawing from the harmony of the spheres, suggested a pattern to the energy manipulation that was both efficient and, in its own way, beautiful. The operation was a symphony of human ingenuity, with Helen conducting. As the Star Forger activated, sending ripples through the fabric of space, the team held their breath. The controlled black hole formed, exactly as planned, and began to draw off the red giant's mass. The star's swelling halted, then slowly it began to contract, its color shifting from the ominous red to a stable yellow. When the process was complete, the simulation screen showed a star reborn. The Celestial Forge had been a theoretical nightmare, but humanity had turned it into a testament to their spirit. The Council, for the first time in its long history, was speechless. Species from across the galaxy watched as a star was saved not by might, not by conquest, but by the daring of a species that had looked to the stars and seen not just lights in the sky, but challenges to be met, mysteries to be unraveled. The human team, looking at the reborn star, knew this was their crowning achievement. They had faced the galaxy's challenges, not as warriors or conquerors, but as innovators, diplomats, and dreamers. They had shown that humanity's place in the cosmos was not granted by strength of arms, but earned through the strength of their ideals, their unity, and their boundless capacity to reach beyond the known. The Celestial Forge was not just the end of the gauntlet, it was the beginning of a new era for humanity. A declaration that among the stars, humanity would not just survive, it would thrive, it would lead, and it would illuminate the darkness with the light of their achievements. <laughs>